Well, if you would open your Bibles to Paul's epistle to the Galatians. Paul's epistle to the Galatians. We're we're going to read verses 1 through 18. Oh, if you will stand with me, we want to give our hearts attention, our pleadings with our blessed God, our loving Father, to grant His Spirit to enlighten us as we read and as we hear Thy Word preached this evening. Galatians 3, beginning in verse 1. This is God's precious Word. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Having ye, have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all the nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith, and the law is not of faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, Yet, if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ The law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Amen. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. My Father in heaven. We have had a precious season of prayer. Now we ask for a precious season of visitation. 
Grant us thy spirit. Fill thy people's hearts with the love and joy of Christ. And may we hear thy word with eager and yearning hearts. And may we find them satisfied in our Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> By God's great grace in Christ Jesus, his holy son, we now return to Paul's brilliant and biblical defense of the gospel in his letter to the Galatians. The title of our message is God's Promises and Covenants. God's Promises and Covenants. It has been some time since we have been in this book. And uh, since that time, uh, we've heard many sermons, had many providences of life and no doubt few of us can remember what the last message was from Galatians. So what I want to do this evening in the hopes of continuing until we get to the end of the letter is uh, I want us to have a review of what we have covered previously and I pray that it will help prepare our hearts for taking up in one of the most difficult chapters in Galatians. So, that being said, I pray that the Spirit of God opens our hearts, grants us eyes and ears of understanding and love for Christ Jesus and all that he is to and for us. So first we want to consider what we covered in chapters 1 and 2. Chapters 1 and 2. Sorry, we don't have the time to read all of that. I urge you to do that in uh, refreshing your minds and hearts for the weeks ahead. <clears throat> Considering our lengthy pause, uh, we will begin with, uh, I hope, a helpful review. In chapter 1 and chapter 2 of this Galatian letter, Paul argued that his apostleship and missionary work among the Gentiles was not from any human authority. It was from Jesus Christ and God the Father. And in his introductory remarks, Paul pointed to the heart of the gospel, Jesus, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us. And God the Father who raised him from the dead. <clears throat> Paul then immediately called down the curse of God upon anyone that preached a gospel that was different from his. Let him be accursed, even if it's an angel. Furthermore, Paul's gospel did not originate in the minds of men. It did not originate in the minds of angels. Certainly, it didn't originate in the mind of devils. Rather, Paul received it by revelation from the resurrected Christ. And that revelation of the gospel makes up the contents of this letter. This is why he's so earnest in his defense of it. The risen Christ came to this persecutor of his people and revealed the gospel that he now preaches and defends. <clears throat> that, that revelation is unfolded in the pages that are before us. And for that reason, Paul argues with it with a heart on fire. Oh, that all our hearts are we're on fire for the gospel that God revealed to us and turned us from our darkness. Oh, may our hearts overflow with love, worship, and adoration 
for him who revealed that truth to our souls. Unfortunately, Judaizers had obviously entered the Galatian churches, attacked Paul's credibility as an apostle, and attempted to discredit his doctrine. So, in these two chapters, Paul established, arguing for, made an apologetic for, the legitimacy and authority of his apostleship. He did so to defend the legitimacy and authority of his gospel. Do we understand that? For his enemies' uh, wise strategy, if they could discredit him, they could lay aside his message. So he defends himself to defend the message. And that's what he does in these, cha these two chapters. <clears throat> Paul's good news was justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in the crucified and resurrected Christ alone, not by works of the law. So then, to reject Paul's gospel was to reject the only Christ-revealed, authentic, divinely originated saving message. It wasn't one gospel among many. There's only one that saves. True enough, there are false gospels. But if we know this gospel, we should be able to recognize the false ones. Paul was so zealous for the truth of Christ that he even rebuked the Apostle Peter publicly for fearing Jews who came to Antioch from Jerusalem. Peter's fear caused him to withdraw from eating with the Gentiles. And by that, he fell back into his old covenant thinking, even though God had showed him otherwise. God himself had proven to Peter, that he could eat the unclean and that he could fellowship with the once unclean. In fact, Paul said to Peter, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Paul would stand for no one, other apostles included, perverting the gospel or its principles. May the Lord grant us such a heart. <clears throat> and that brought us to chapter 3. <clears throat> Having established his apostolic authority, even rebuking a fellow apostle, Paul will now powerfully make experiential, biblical, and theological arguments for his gospel in chapter 3 and chapter 4. These are difficult chapters, brethren. We will take our time as we work through them in the hopes that we will all see uh, the truth that Paul is arguing for. His arguments are not always easy to follow. He's a perfect example of Peter having said, you know, some of the things that Paul writes are hard to understand. Well, we're right on that ground. Because he's coming after the very roots of the false gospel because he's a Jew and it's Jews that are distorting the gospel. He knows their theology. He believed their theology. He grieves for his fellow Jews that don't understand that Christ is the Messiah. But he also knows that what some of these zealot Jews are doing is falsifying the gospel by adding obedience to the law of Moses to that precious good news. 
So, <clears throat> his purpose, chapters 3 and 4, is to refute, in fact, I, I would say, is to annihilate the false and mutilated gospel of the Judaizers that the Galatians had embraced. So let's review verses 1 through 5 very briefly. Paul begins with a rebuke. O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Who has put a spell upon you? Something's happened to you that has messed with your mind. Has to be some overpowering power. They've bewitched you. How is it that that's happened? That ye should not obey the truth. Before whose eyes, listen to these words. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. What an extraordinary way to describe preaching. But there's a model. Our preaching should evidently set forth Christ so clearly and so powerfully that it would be as if he were crucified in our midst. Crucified, resurrected, ascended into glory, seated at the Father's right hand. What God's word says, God says. So we should be preaching it in faith, preaching it with all of our hearts, preaching it, calling down God's power and spirit so that the reality of these words are not simply sitting on the page, sitting and floating in our brains while we're thinking about something else, but hearing our God speaking to our souls. Awakening us from our stupor. Shaking us out of flesh and religion. Shaking us. When we leave our first love. How could you be bewitched? Something's happened. Before your eyes, Christ has been evidently set forth. Preached. How could he say that? Because he preached it to them. So, Paul then asked five questions of the Galatians from their own experience of hearing and believing Christ's gospel. Paul's purpose was to make the Galatians realize that receiving the Holy Spirit and experiencing miracles did not come by the works of the law. Their experience of receiving the mighty Holy Spirit, the transforming Spirit, the new creature-creating Spirit. Receiving that Spirit was tied directly to Paul's preaching, Christ crucified, Christ resurrected, and then believing it. They're believing it. That utterly refuted any notion of receiving the Spirit by the works of the law. They knew that. He had preached it to them. He's reached into their memory banks and pulled it out. How'd you receive that Spirit? That glorious power that fell upon you. That drew you out of your pagan darkness. Drew you away from your idols. Drew you away from the life you were living without God. And brought you to the glorious Christ, the Son of God, the willing Savior who saved every one of you. You professed Him. What happened to you? What happened? Paul wanted their Christian life to be characterized by faith. Faith from the beginning to the end. Not part of the way. But all the way through, lives characterized by faith in Christ. Not trusting Him 
sometimes when we need some things, but trusting ourselves the rest. No. Paul could not tolerate them believing that they could begin their Christian life in the Holy Spirit and then finish it by their works of the law. He's astonished. I mean, you can almost feel the aching in his heart. The, the if I can say, the psychological pain. What are you believing? You started in the Spirit. God opened your heart. He, he opened your eyes. You wouldn't have believed a word I said except for that Spirit. The miracles that are taking place in the midst. How did that happen? Was it because you decided to keep Moses' law? Tell you what, fleshly religion can draw us away in a hurry. We need constantly to remember this is a supernatural religion, a religion of revelation given to us by Almighty God Himself through the power of His Spirit. You can't live five seconds. A Christian life without the Spirit of God guiding you. You can't even sin against God without God giving you another breath and heartbeat. He wanted people that live by faith. That's our heritage, is it not? To live by faith. There's not an on and off button for this. If we have the Spirit... We should be using that faith, faith day by day by day. Or sooner or later, we'll start trusting in something else. It's guaranteed. Generally, it will be ourselves. Worst decision we could make. Worst experience to follow. It's all in Christ. Look to Christ. Have faith in Christ every day. You don't need the gospel once in a while. You need it every day. The gospel is not simply an open door into the better things. That's the way a lot of people think. Well, I believe the gospel. Just having a little trouble living. Well, are you living in the light of the gospel daily? Are you living knowing that the living Christ poured out his life's blood that you might stand before God, a justified person? When you failed yesterday, when you failed today, when you failed tomorrow, do you run to Christ? Amen. Is that where you go? Do you live by faith? Do you say, Lord, I know that in myself, I know that in my flesh there's no good thing. I know it. But I have Christ. I have your son. I have your spirit. I have your word. And I have your people. Amen. I'll make it. By Christ. Amen. Now, these are important matters. Paul is stunned. So what does he do? He doesn't berate them. But he does go after them with a pastoral heart. He's going to open up the magazine of biblical ammunition. And he's going to take aim and he's going to start firing. <clears throat> This is verses 6 through 14. Then in these passages, in these words, the apostle fired a barrage of arguments from his scripture canon to support his argumentation. He pulled out the big guns here. Number one, from Genesis 15, 6, he tells them, Abraham believed God. He wants them to remember they came into the kingdom by faith. He wants them to know they cannot finish in the flesh. So he's going to set the issues of faith before them. And he says from Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. From that, Paul declared that the true children of Abraham, whether Jew or Gentile, are those and those only who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and do not depend on the works of the law to be right with God. 
We hear today a lot about truth bombs. I've been hearing that term a lot. <clears throat> a truth bomb is a statement made that might seem shocking to the recipient. Got that? It's like something that blows up in their mind. Something that blows up into their consciousness. This is the official definition, by the way, from that great encyclopedia of the Internet. <clears throat> but it's a statement that's made which might seem shocking to the, re re uh, the recipient, but is the truth. It's shocking because it is the truth, and they're living in lies. You believe all this stuff NBC and CNN tells you about COVID? You're living in a veil of deception and lies. But sin is worse than that. It's a worse disease. It is a worse plague when it's the plague of the heart. So a truth bomb shakes people up. It's un they're usually unsuspecting of it. They're not anticipating that someone's going to come and drop that on them. And they are often left disoriented because now their sense of reality is shifted. That's what truth does. That's what truth does. Our flesh is backwards. Unless God gives us a new heart, our flesh will still rebel against it. Now, why do I take time for something like a truth bomb? Because among the many truth bombs that Paul dropped in this letter, this is among the most shocking to the Jews. Listen carefully. <clears throat> Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. That is explosive. Mentally disorienting for someone who thinks, I'm in God's kingdom because of my circumcision. I'm, I've got a wonderful future, whatever it may be, because I've kept the law, etc., etc. Or, I believe in Jesus, and you folks can believe in Jesus, that's fine. But in order to be Christians, real Christians, you've got to keep Moses' law. Now, this is to be saved. We're not talking about what guidance we might get from God's laws and the principles within them. We're talking about being right with God. Jesus plus is not the gospel. It's never the gospel. Jesus plus is always a distortion. And Jesus plus is easier to believe because it's fleshly and fleshy people will go with it. This is a spiritual religion. This is a supernatural religion. And our flesh wants to govern it. So, this truth bomb, that those that have faith like Abraham are the children of Abraham. We have to remember, I'll bring up more about this later as we get into the chapter, Abraham was not a Jew. What? <laughs> he was from Ur of the Chaldees. There were no Jews. God chose him to be the father of a nation that became the Jews. He was their father. We might say, well, you know, as God brought him into covenant with him, gave him the covenant of circumcision, then we might call him uh, the first and the real Jew. That's possible. There's a lot of discussion of those kind of things. But the fact is, this was a pagan that God saved. And he made a nation from him. And from that nation came our Savior. 
Now, that nation knew that it was God's chosen people. They knew that. God told them that. And he said, if you're faithful to my covenant, you will be my treasure, my peculiar treasure among all the people of the world. Well, they believed themselves to be that peculiar treasure. Showed it with their circumcision and other things. The idea that Gentiles could just walk into the kingdom, say that they could believe on Jesus and everything would be okay, that was a truth bomb for the Jews in the, in the most real sense. It's not only disorienting, it was often anger-provoking, murderous anger. As Paul well knew, having once been among them as a murderous Jew. Well, number two, Paul then argued from Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, and chapter 18, verse 18. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, meaning the Gentiles, through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying... In thee shall all the nations be blessed. When God made that glorious promise to Abraham, that wonderful covenant, Abraham believed it. And by believing God's promise, he was actually believing Christ. He was believing on Christ. That great nation would produce the Savior. Paul's point should be clear to us. So, then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. They're like their father. They believe God and they believe Christ. Number three, the apostle warned the Galatians from Deuteronomy 27, 9 and 28, 58 through 59, or 58 and 59, that if they embraced the works of the law for their righteousness, they would also bring the curse of the law upon themselves. Paul says, all right, you want to keep the law? Do you want to put yourself under the law? Do you want to be under the Deuteronomy covenant? Oh, fine. I just make sure that you remember that when you do that, when you're circumcised, and you say, yes, I'm going to do all of these things that I'm required by the Deuteronomic law. Just remember, there's a curse. There's a curse. And if you fail at any point, curses will fall. As many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Paul is not giving them any breathing room. Why? Because he's a hard shell fundamentalist. You think? No, he loved those people's immortal souls. If you love people's souls, you want them to have the only truth that saves. And he was not going to give up. He was absolutely, I mean, he's just taking one shot after another. He's dropping one Truth bomb after another. He wants false doctrine eradicated from their thinking. So he takes out the, the, the word of God. And he keeps arguing from the scriptures. <clears throat> Number four, Paul then proved from Habakkuk chapter two, verse four, that justification by faith was and is the doctrine of Holy Scripture. Old covenant and new covenant. You had to be a people of faith. Abraham believed God. And it was counted to him for righteousness. The just shall live by faith. That's the old, that's the old covenant saying that. In contrast, Paul quotes Leviticus 18.5 next. The law is not of faith. Do you see the two together? The just shall live by faith. The law is not of faith. 
He is pressing them mentally. He is pressing them to think, what is it that saves my soul? But if you want to turn to the law, you're going to have to think about this. You were Gentiles. You were never under the law. And now you're going to have someone come in and tell you, all right, without being circumcised, without keeping the Sabbath, and without the food laws, and without all the rest of the laws, if you don't keep them, Jesus doesn't do you that much good. What? Well, that's what they were dealing with. Read the book of Acts. It shows up in Acts over and over again. Oh, my brethren, this is vital for us, and sometimes we need refreshers on how it is, as a brother Nate preached recently, on how does God see you? Well, Paul knew he wanted to just be found wrapped up in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that should be the desire for every one of us. And it should have been the desire for the Galatians. Something happened. It's called bad doctrine, false gospel, another spirit. <clears throat> The law is not a faith. Now, no sinful person ever has or ever will keep it perfectly. No one uh, kept it perfectly in that day. That's why there was a sacrificial system with it. When you sin like this, bring that creature. When you sin like that, bring this creature. If you want to bring a food offering, bring this. I mean, it had a whole system for failure. That's why Paul could say concerning the law, I was blameless. He wasn't saying I kept the law perfectly as far as every jot and tittle. But he's saying I even kept the laws of the sacrifices as God commanded. My conscience was clear. That's how he could say uh, my conscience was clear. I kept the law. When I failed, I kept the law. I brought the sacrifice. Now, only, listen carefully, there is no, there is, now I'm preaching to the choir to a certain degree, but I'm going to press you to think and think on this hard, hard. There is no saving righteousness by works of the law. Only faith in the work of Jesus Christ saves the never dying soul of human beings. There is a righteousness of the law. God even said to Israel, I'm giving you my law. It shall be your righteousness. The nations are going to look at you and say, that's a righteous people because of the law that they walk in. But that's also why the prophet says, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. When it comes to being right with God, no one has kept it perfectly but the Lord Jesus. And we have his righteousness. He kept it perfectly. So, Paul's line of argument from those verses then is this. He's taken all of these truth bombs and dropped them on the Galatians and the Jews among them. The, the Galatians did not need circumcision. This is what he's saying. You don't need this. They're telling you otherwise. You don't need this. You don't need food laws. You don't need Sabbath keeping or obedience to any of the Mosaic law to be the people of God. Thermonuclear truth bomb. They had faith in Christ and received the Holy Spirit by faith in Christ. Having Abraham's faith proved that they were Abraham's children. All truth bombs. But Paul was not finished with his mighty demolition work here. <clears throat> there was more, more, more to come of his pastoral and apologetic work as his spirit-breathed letter unfolds. <clears throat> In chapter 3, verse 15, through chapter 4, verse 7, we're not going to read all of that, and we certainly haven't moved through all of that in our exposition. But Paul mounts up another onslaught, I can't think of a better word, upon the Judaizers' false gospel. In it, he takes up a new weapon from his biblical arsenal and wields it with great power. 
He had already argued from uh, Abraham's covenant. And now he continues wielding that sword of the Spirit to defend the supremacy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He does this by showing the priority of the Abrahamic covenant to the Mosaic covenant. He's going to say, this is the one. Mosaic covenant was just in the middle. It was intermediate. It's passed away. The Abrahamic covenant still stands. All the nations are going to be blessed. It's all in Christ. Now, this is an essential part of the letter. We will give some time to it. <clears throat> but to prepare our hearts for that argument, uh, we took up a very brief introduction to the biblical covenants. Some have never considered the importance of the covenants. Uh, I, I would say to you, and I don't, I don't say this in, uh, I don't know how this sounds to anybody. <clears throat> uh, not chastening anybody, not uh, trying to attack anybody. Uh, not looking down on anyone. <laughs> if, you, if you feel oppressed later, let me know. All right? But most of us don't think much about the covenants. And I'm saying, if you don't understand the covenants, you will not understand the word of God as you should. I'm not saying you won't understand certain verses. I won't, I'm not saying you won't be able to get certain truths out of the Bible. I'm not saying that. But the Bible does not unfold on something called dispensations. It unfolds on the revelation of God in what are called covenants. And he says so. It's astounding. This is the way he deals with men. It is with covenants, through covenants and promises. He reveals himself. He reveals what he's going to do. He reveals mighty works in his covenant. And if you look each time that he makes a covenant with someone. Now I'm talking about his covenants to men. Not necessarily the covenants men make among themselves. But God's covenants always reveal something about him. Something that he promises or will do with, with mighty works. And, uh, and then if you see that you'll watch the Bible unfold on those principles. If you're not doing that, you're missing some very important things. If I can say it this way, Genesis 3.15, we'll look at that just a moment, is like the womb out of which the rest of the Bible emerges. If we're not thinking in those terms, we're, not, we're probably not connecting the dots well. It is a matter of, that helps you understand the scriptures with much greater clarity. <clears throat> so what is a covenant then? Uh, we, we were right at this stage last time when we, le uh, when we quit, uh, when we paused. And uh, uh, it's a biblical, a biblical and a divine covenant is a solemn promise or oath of God to man. It's God saying, I will do this. Watch. Believe this. When, when it says in, in, in Genesis, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness, it was right as God was making a covenant with him. He had given him a covenant in Genesis chapter 12, and then he comes back in, in 13, and then in chapter 15 of Genesis, where he opens up that thing so wide. And if you see that, you begin to see what's happening. Where did Israel, the nation, come from? God says, I'm going to make you a nation. Not only am I going to make you a nation, kings are going to come out of you. Uh, anybody ever heard of the book of Kings? The book of Samuel? The book of Chronicles? That all comes directly out of the Abrahamic covenant. It's exactly God doing what he said he's going to do. A biblical covenant is a solemn promise or oath of God to man. 
We also acknowledge that a very helpful shorthand definition is this. If you can't remember a longer definition, you can always say it's a defined relationship. It's a defined relationship. When you get married, you'll, the, the, generally if you're doing a Christian wedding, even sometimes when it's not, there will be someone officiating it and they will say, will you do this? Mm-hmm. Will you do this? Mm-hmm. Y'all going to do this for a long time? Mm-hmm. All right. I pronounce you man and wife. What did they just do? They entered into a defined relationship. I'm going to do this. You're going to do that. And we're going to walk in that. This is exactly what God did. He created his bride. He took her out into the desert in Exodus. Took her out to the Mount Sinai and gave the wedding vows. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make into thee any graven image of anything. Any likeness. Things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth. Be faithful to me, he says. And he later says when he's going to make a new covenant. I was a husband to them. We're not reading something in. This is what he says. In other words, one of the important things about marriages is that they should say to the world, this is how God loves his people. And this is how his people reverence him. And that's why Satan does everything he can to destroy it. Covenants. The Bible's full of them. <clears throat> but there are certain major covenants upon which the whole story of the Bible unfolds. Uh, my brethren, the Word of God, the Word of God, and you know this happens. The Word of God raises up our minds sometimes. Raises us into eternity. It pulls back the curtain and lets us know things that God is doing and planning. Isn't it right there in the first chapter? I mean, when uh, the first chapter of Genesis. First chapter of Genesis. Let us make man in our image. We wouldn't have known that. Not one of us here would have known that. But God in the first chapter, pulls back the veil, lets us see the meeting, the agreement, the plan. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to make man in our image. And they're going to reign with us. We're going to give them regal power over the earth. We're going to give them dominion. You wouldn't know that. And sometimes we surely don't live like it. There ought to be something about us. There ought to be something about us in which we live like the princes and princesses of our great king. Amen. That we have something of the family resemblance. Not going to be perfect in this world. It will be in the next. Amen. We're on the way. The very fact that you're here this evening means you want to know something about the living God. Well, I'm setting it before you. Uh -uh. we get to look in the scriptures and there is genuine revelation revealing something to us. And we get to see something about God's eternal purpose. None of us, none of us has ever sat down at the table with God <laughs> and said, let's plan something. But we can open up the book and we can see what he planned. We can see his purpose. No, that God's eternal purpose among the members of the Godhead is where our, our salvation began. It began before God said, let there be light. We often call this heavenly agreement among the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We call it the covenant of redemption. There was an agreement. And the eternal Son agreed to become man so that he could die for his bride, cleanse his bride, bring her to himself, and reign with her forever. We're told that right here in God's book. Covenants are important. Whether you want to call that a covenant or not, there was a holy agreement. The Holy Spirit didn't die on the cross. The Father didn't die on the cross. The Son died on the cross. 
And he said, I came to do my father's will. So he wasn't forced to do it. He wanted to do it. I come, I come, Lord, says Psalm 110. Well, anyway, Paul told Timothy that God, listen carefully, Paul is encouraging Timothy. Timothy had a fear problem. <clears throat> and so Paul's encouraging his younger brother, his right arm, and he says to him that God called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Now, do you think about that? Do you think about that? It's right here in the scriptures. But John Calvin must have put that in there. No, the Holy Spirit of God put that in there. Before God created the heavens and the earth, we had been given a glorious holy calling and salvation. And it wasn't according to us. It was according to His purpose and His grace. It was given to us in Christ Jesus before that world began, but is now made manifest. Oh, this is great. I love that transition. We go from eternity in heaven into history. Just like that. Paul does it regularly. Read him. You'll be talking about the wonders of eternity. And the next thing you know, you're back on earth. What? What? He says, this, this purpose was made manifest. Well, how was it revealed? By the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. In this one sweeping statement, Paul moves from eternity to history in extremely clear language. And he tells us the following things. One, salvation of God's people began in eternity. You can look in your own personal history and, and think about the time you were without Christ. And then think about the time when someone was, was telling you about Christ or God was dealing with you from the scriptures. And then you realize there was a time when you really were a new creature. You repented of your sins. You believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You began to walk with him. You began to eat up the Bible. It was your food. It was a love letter from heaven. You wanted to know him and walk with him and be with him. It started in eternity with a plan, with an agreement. And then number two, salvation for God's people is rooted in God's purpose and grace, not in our works. Three, God gave this salvation to his people in Christ Jesus before the world began. All the blessings that we have now and forever come through one golden duck come through one golden pipe, the Lord Jesus, one channel, Jesus Christ. Before the foundation of the world, everything that you and I love and desire about him, uh, all the gifts that he's given us, whatever they may be, giving us, most importantly, the Spirit, but the, Spirit, the, the word that the Spirit gave. Brethren, what do we have? We have heavenly gifts. They all came through Jesus before the world began. Wonderful gifts from heaven. At, at, at moments, I know many of you won't believe it, but I mean, this leaves me almost speechless. Yeah. If you believe it, then when I look back over my life and I see the, un, the unbelievable fool that I was, the unbelievable self-worshipper that before the foundation of the world, God knew that. He knew, he knew the cesspool I was going to swim in. And he said to his son, shed your blood for him and then load him up with gifts from heaven. Paul knows all this. We're mostly quoting his scriptures in, in some of these things. 
That's why he's fighting so hard for the gospel. He, he knows the treasure that it is. Number four, salvation appeared in history in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Five, salvation, life, and immortality is revealed in the gospel message. That's what's got Paul's heart. That's why he's fighting for the souls. We hear, I hear all the time, you know, from the truth tellers, we're fighting for the soul of America. We're fighting for the, no, they're talking about a political agenda. Might be conservative, but that's what they're talking about. Saving the soul of America comes through Jesus Christ. Amen. Preach Jesus Christ, regardless of who's in the office of president. Regardless of the politics you have, you need to know heavenly politics. You need to know the king. You need to know his law. You need to know his constitution. You need to know his covenants. But it's all revealed with the gospel. With the gospel. Are you following the track here? Covenants are important. The covenants unfold the glorious purpose of God. And it's a historical working out of what God intends to do. He's not failed one day. There isn't one day since he said, let there be light. Not one day where he went, oh, that was a bad day today. Didn't get anything done. Never. I intended to save 500 people today, and I only got like 35. Never happens. And I'm not trying to be foolish. I'm saying to you, we think like that, but God is every day saving his elect wherever they are. Right now, we're sending so much to the Philippines. I hope that that, so, so much literature, gospel literature, I pray that that place catches on fire of revival. That the power of God's awakening moves through them. But it'll only come by their understanding of the gospel. And that'll only come when the Holy Spirit falls upon them. And we need the same here. Number six. The gospel is the heart of the new covenant. The new covenant, y'all. You say, why are covenants important? Listen carefully. This is the new covenant in my blood. Is that important? It's the most important thing in, in existence. God covenanted and his son utterly fulfilled it perfectly and saves every single person that comes to him. Everyone. Every single one of them. That is just astounding. It is astonishing to my soul. Well, so <clears throat> all begins in eternity. And it unfolds historically in the Abrahamic covenant, what God promised and revealed to him. Then that goes, uh, the next uh, is, is the, uh, no, it's the Noahic covenant, then the Abrahamic covenant. We go to the Noahic covenant. You say, why is that so important? Well, because God promised he wouldn't destroy the earth by flood anymore. And he says, as long as the heavens are there and the, and, and, uh, the earth is here, uh, it's going to go right on. Why? Because that's the theater where he's working out his salvation and purpose. We're still here because he didn't wipe out the whole world again with a flood. He might wipe out a portion, portion. He might shake the earth and destroy a place. He might send some fire. But today's coming when he's going to burn this whole thing up. Right. All your trinkets, all your trash, all your, Troy, uh, t uh, all your uh, trophies, uh, all of your, your little statues, all of your awards, all your medals, it's all, all going to be gone. All your stuff's going to be gone. And you'll either be uh, cast into hell with eternal fire or in the glories of Christ having the treasure of your heart for eternity. Amen. The treasure of your heart for eternity. Now, maybe that's a little more than you want to know about covenants, but it's vital for you to at this point because this is where Paul is going to start making his arguments. He's going to be talking about the Abrahamic covenant as opposed to the Mosaic covenant. All the Jews are still in their minds under the Mosaic covenant. That's why they're trying to get this message that Paul is taking to the world kind of wed with the Mosaic covenant. It's one of the reasons Paul wrote Galatians. It's a perfectly 
new covenant letter. It's a perfectly new covenant theology. And as he casts himself into the midst of the hearts of the Galatians to try to draw them back to the truth, we get to understand some of the most important things about the gospel and Christian living and apologetics, defending our gospel. So, we go from Noahic to Abrahamic to the Mosaic Covenant and then to the Davidic Covenant. Son of David will be on the throne forever. And he is right now. It's just not the ones we thought. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus is the Son of David. So now, my dear brethren, when you stop and think about it, the New Covenant is what the whole Bible is aiming at. Where God saves his people and brings them to him through eternity. All are fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. <clears throat> People say, oh, well, see, it talks about Israel there. Well, then and the writer to the Hebrews turns around, puts that right on the church. I will establish. I will make my covenant. I will put my law in their inward parts. I will write it in their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's all covenant language. If you're here, and you love Christ. You're in his covenant. Amen. You are in his covenant. It's because of his covenant. So. And that fills out our biblical context for the passage that we'll be taking up. <clears throat> Paul wants to argue from the covenants. Not all of them, but we just look at a little bit regarding them because they're the structure of this Bible. They are the unfolding of God's eternal purpose. And with every revelation, we learn more about how God loves us. With every revelation, every covenant, we learn more about who he is and what he's done to save his people from their sins. It's in seed form. We go back to the, the covenant of creation and Adam and Eve and the unfolding of Genesis 3.15. There's going to be a, a serpent with a crushed head. Why? Because of God's covenant, God's promise. And that's the unfolding. That is the very heart from which everything in the scripture comes. So that's our covenant. And that's our context, and that's the passage we will pick up in next time. Paul's argument for the supremacy of the Abrahamic covenant to the Mosaic covenant is a, an intense argument, and it's something that he knows will bristle the Jews. But he also knows, as a former Jew, that the new covenant is better, and Christ alone is better. So may our loving Heavenly Father grant us the illumination of the Holy Spirit as we continue in Paul's defense of the gospel. Amen. Father, I thank you for your grace and mercy. I thank thee for thy love. I thank thee for what thou hast given us in Christ. I thank thee for these sheep. Father, how thou dost love these sheep. Before the foundation of the world, you saw every single one of them in their blood. And you passed by and said, live, live, live. Not one of them disobeyed. I thank thee, O righteous Father, for every regenerate soul here. And I pray for those that are not, that you would regenerate them as soon as thou wilt. Father, young or old, bring them to a clear understanding of the, of the glories of Christ. Now, my Jesus, bless thy people. Uh -uh, and I pray that thou wouldst uh, take us from this place to ponder thy great works in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please stand with me. <clears throat> there are many, many wonderful benedictions. I have 
favorites, of course. But so many of them are wonderful blessings to God's people. And this is one of them. <clears throat> now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. And that's right there in the scriptures. This is a spirit-breathed blessing. And I pray that it falls on you with its full weight. <laughs> Making you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Brethren, let's go in the name of Christ Jesus.